guys are like, come on up here. Thanks. <laughs> Have you ever read a road sign? A road sign that's telling you which way to go. But how do you really know if you're going the right way or the wrong way? About two years ago, I did my very first volunteer charity mission to Vietnam. I can just hear my father now. You couldn't have picked anything closer to home? <sighs> Mr. Toastmaster, members, guests, was I taking the wrong turn? No Ordinary Journey Foundation is a local charity that works with severely stricken children with cerebral palsy. I was asked by Laverne, the founder, to come on board and join her team in March of 2014 to Vietnam to be their videographer. It worked out so well because I was already building up video equipment to do my own video recordings. This experience would be invaluable to me. Plus, it would give me a chance to volunteer and to give back. How could I pass that up? In four months time, I was on a plane headed to Vietnam with three other local volunteers, a social worker, a nurse from the Alberta Children's Hospital, a physiotherapist, and of course, Laverne. But I'd be gone for 18 days, taking two weeks out of my personal holiday time, paying all my expenses there and back, using my own video gear, leaving my wife here in Canada, all while leaving behind a father-in-law who just passed away barely two months ago. Was I taking the right turn? We arrived in Saigon to meet two more of our volunteers, a physiotherapist from Hungary, Katlin, and Dr. Barry Rowicki from the Bonash Children's Hospital in Australia. And we had numerous Vietnamese volunteers who were going to be our translators and cultural attaches. We had a well-rounded team. I had the best seat in the house. I was gonna be behind that video camera, not only watching the stories unfold before me, but catching them on videotape so the charity can use them. It was a fantastic opportunity. Our missions revolved around two-day workshops in hospitals, both in the city and in the country. Up to 50 mothers would bring their young children in with cerebral palsy, and our physiotherapists would work with them in different workshops, showing them how the children can gain better, more independence. Some of them, how to even hold a spoon, how to feed themselves. It was an opportunity of a lifetime. But my favorite part were the home visits. It was the second last day of our mission. It was Thursday afternoon, and it was my home visit. Now, this visit was special. If it wasn't bad enough that we were six hours south of Saigon into the heart of the Mekong Delta, the poorest regions of Vietnam, there would be another hour drive from the hotel on the highway. There'd be a 15-minute motorbike ride on the back of a five-foot-wide concrete path. They called their back roads. We didn't have to cross a footbridge, balance across a monkey bridge, walk a narrow path to arrive at Can's house. It's a tin roof, grass-walled, hard dirt floor house, but very neat and tidy. Can is a 16-year-old boy, severe, severe cerebral palsy. Legs are mangled. He sits in a ball. He's got to be carried everywhere. His mother tells us that he can barely hear and has very poor control of his bodily functions. Because I was videotaping, I was the last one to come in and meet him. But when I did, all of a sudden, my father-in-law's fa face flashed in front of me. You know, they both had that same warm glow and pleasant smile. It took me by surprise, but I didn't think much of it. We were there for about two, three hours talking with the parents. The whole community came around and it was like a great big circle. If they thought it was a big deal for them, it was a big deal for me. And about two hours we left. Next day, Friday, 
was the last day of our mission. And those same children would be coming to the hospital with their parents. So our doctor, Dr. Barry, can assess them on the flat table. Can recognize me. And he smiled. Can's turn came up. We put him on the table. And Dr. Barry, after about 10 minutes, looks to Laverne and, and says, there's nothing we could do for Can. But he really does need a wheelchair. Laverne glowingly turns to me and looks at Dr. Barry and says, well, we just got a wheelchair donation from Terry and his wife this morning, barely four hours ago. You see, that morning at 7 a.m. when I was sitting in a hotel lobby waiting for our team to come down after breakfast, I gave my wife a quick call on Skype as I did most mornings. And I told her about what we were doing and she says she finally made that online donation for a wheelchair for that mission that morning. We talked about it weeks before, but nothing since. I kind of had my hands full. So the day finished up with Can being measured up. Our team measured him up so that a local wheelchair could be made for him, assembled, and delivered. About two weeks later, long after we're gone home. We finished up the mission with a one-hour ride back to the hotel with our whole team on the bus. We were celebrating. There was a lot of sharing of heartfelt stories. It was a great way to end this mission. We got back to the hotel about 5 o'clock, and I decided to give my wife another quick call on Skype and just tell her how the whole mission rounded out. I told her, you know, Ken, the boy that I met in my home visit barely 24 hours ago was in bad need of that wheelchair that we just donated that morning, Friday, April 4th. She pauses and she says, funny thing, that Friday was exactly two months to the day that her dad passed away in Winnipeg. You see, he barely made 85 years of age. He had severe multiple sclerosis. His legs were mangled up in much the same way as Cam's and he spent the last two, 20 years of his life in a wheelchair. That's when I knew I made the right turn. It's early 2015 and I'm trying to plan out my next year and it's I'm with this amazing organization. Maybe some of you have heard of it. It's called uh, Toastmasters. <laughs> I was speaking to Doris and I said, you know, Doris, I'd like to plan out next year. You have any ideas? And she says, well, you could think about being a division director. I tried not to make eye contact. <laughs> that was easy because we were on email. She said, the club you're in now is in that division, Division K my initial. <laughs> I said, let me think about it for the weekend and I'll let you know. Monday came, I still felt good about it, emailed her back and said, that's it, I'm in, I'll do it. Now, the whole time I was deciding this, I didn't so much as breathe a word of this to my wife <laughs> because it would mean a little extra time from home. I wanted to make a completely sound, clear, unbiased decision. Two days later, I'm uh, waiting for my wife to come home from work so we can have dinner together, and uh, she's a little bit late. But when she finally steps through the door, she says, sorry, I had to stop into HomeSense. Surprise, surprise. But I bought this really cool thing. <laughs> That's when I knew I made the right turn. Am I making this up? Are these coincidences? Seeing my father-in-law's face and Kant's face. <clears throat> the wheelchair delivery on the day after I met Ken, on the day my father-in-law passed away two months previous, my wife coming home with the K. Signs, these are more like life signs. I think each and every one of us since the day we were born have been approached by their own life signs. 
And it's just a matter of time that through life, learning how to live, that eventually some of us begin to see our life signs. And they patiently sit there. They wait for us to gradually learn how to see them, read them, interpret them. Those life signs are what tell us whether what we do is right or wrong. They're there to help us out. Listen to your life signs. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you.